Good morning, Faith family, and hey, congratulations. It's Friday. You made it. I know this is a day you've been looking for all week long uh, for our kids, our teachers, administrators. Uh, it's day two of school being back in and very uncertain and unusual circumstance and situation due to COVID-19. So we started off the week on Sunday by praying over our school campuses. That was walking the campus, driving through the campus. I saw several of you come by and honk at us. Good job. Uh, thank you for taking the time to saturate our campus with prayer. I know our teachers, our administrators, and especially our students need those prayers. And uh, let's continue that theme of prayer, understanding that we are strengthened. We, we, we as a church, we're strengthened when we pray, when, especially when we pray together. And we're looking at the last part of verse 16. Uh, and I'm actually going to go ahead and add on verse 17 because I, and 18 because they clearly go with what James is saying in verse 16. So let's look at those verses. First of all, the, the prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Now, at first glance, we see that, and the, the thing that catches our attention is righteous person. And we're thinking, well, that automatically disqualifies me because I'm not a righteous person. But what we need to do is understand what righteous means. Uh, righteous doesn't necessarily mean the absence of sin, per se, um, because we all sin. Uh, instead, what righteous means is in right standing with God. And so, obviously, as we saw in the verses yesterday, we definitely want to go through the process of confession. Uh, and so maybe what I should have said is, is we want to think about a perfect person. Um, but there's no, there's not a perfect person. Jesus is the only perfect one. And so after we've come through the process of confession and we have sensed the Father's forgiveness and we've experienced his cleansing, then guess what? We're in that position of righteousness. Not because we earned it or deserved it, but because we asked of God and God granted that request by his grace. And so don't get distracted by that statement, the prayer of a righteous person, and think that's referring to some elite level of sainthood or, or a minister or a priest, anything like that. No, no, it's talking about any born-again believer who's now in right standing with God. Nothing is inhibiting their fellowship with God. And that's important because the next statement is that person in right standing with God, their prayer has a powerful effect. Now, one of the things I want to do is, is kind of refer to the New American Standard on this one because they translate it a little more in the, the literal order of things, saying this, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Now, the word effective is translated from the word energio, which we get energy. And so the CSB captures the idea, the NASB, the New American, explicitly spells it out in terms of what's being conveyed there. So the prayer of a righteous person has a lot of energy, has a capacity to accomplish much. We know that energy typically is, is always going to be involved in, in you know, the activity or the accomplishing of something. And then the example, verses 17 and 18, Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Now listen to that. Let's hear how James it puts us into that category because you think about Elijah. He was a prophet, one of the greatest prophets in all of Israel, Israel's history. And yet James says he was a man just like us. He had a nature just like us. But because he prayed fervently, because he prayed with great energy and passion, and he prayed not for something to be set that would satisfy Elijah, but for something that would really grab the attention of the people. They were not in a good place spiritually. They had a king, King Ahab, who was continuing to lead them, because of the influence of his wife, down a path that was contrary to the will of God and the word of God in the worship of Baal. And so Elijah, recognizing that, knowing that the people needed something to get their attention, prayed fervently, prayed earnestly, the CSB says, that it would not rain, and for three years and six months, it didn't rain. Not a drop. 39 consecutive months without any rain. And the desolation was widespread. It was it was destructive because Israel is an agrarian culture, so there was no way to feed their livestock. Any crops they tried to grow would fail. It devastated the people, and it got their attention. But then verse 18 says this, Then he prayed again. And the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, the context of that is, is we've already had the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. The prophets of Baal prayed fervently. They cut themselves. They chanted. They did everything they did could do to bring down fire to consume their gift on an altar. Nothing happened. Imagine that. 
But when Elijah prayed to God, Elijah even saturated the sacrifice and he prayed to God. God consumed everything. There was even, the text even says there was a tongue of fire that licked up every drop of moisture, indicating that Yahweh is God alone. And then to top it off, Elijah reminded them that God is the God of grace and that God is the God who restores. And he prayed for rain, sending his servant seven times. On the seventh time, he says, I see a small little bitty cloud. But that cloud saturated the ground. It brought refreshing rain. And so remember, Elijah was a man with our name. He was a man just like we are. But when we are in proper standing with God, nothing is inhibiting our fellowship with him. When we pray with, with earnestness, we pray with, with energy, with passion, because what we're praying about, we have a strong conviction for. God answers that prayer because that conviction can only come by the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So two things our author asks in response to this text is, why is it important that we live righteous lives? Because it's only when we're characterized by righteousness that we are ready and we're in the proper condition to pray according to the will of God. Because the will of man is not inhibiting or preventing our prayers or distorting, uh, maybe manipulating us toward a man-centered prayer. Instead, we're pursuing the things of God. So righteousness is essential, being in right standing. Secondly, when have you seen prayers have a powerful effect? Man, where do I start with that one? I've seen it over and over again. I've seen some powerful things happen through the prayer of God's people. So let's not underestimate what God will do through the prayer of his people. And this Sunday, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 4, where Peter and John go back and report the persecution, and the people pray, and the power of God is demonstrated in response to their prayer. Let's not dismiss that, church. We desperately need that. We don't need structured prayer meetings We need the people of God passionately praying. So start now, and then Sunday we're going to look at the text in in Acts chapter 4 and just see how God responds to the passionate prayer of His people. So make today that day where you honor Him, and as you do that, you're going to do it by living sin.